Kia ora everyone, I'm Dr Helen Fulcher and welcome to this Good Fellow Unit webinar on identifying surgical mesh harm and optimising management. This webinar is kindly supported by the Ministry of Health and ACC. We have two speakers joining us on this topic. Dr Nikki Dykes, who's a subspecialist urogynecologist experienced in the multidisciplinary management of complex pelvic health conditions, including mesh complications. And Dr Samsam Lowe, a consultant urologist with special interests in female and male urethral stricture disease, primary and recurrent incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse, vaginal mesh and mesh sling removals, as well as general urological conditions. Welcome, Nikki and Samson. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So um, thank you for having us to talk today. Um, we're quite pleased to be here discussing this quite complex topic. Um, the background for this presentation really um, lies in the Restorative Justice Report, which was published by the Ministry of Health in December 2019. This is entitled Hearing and Responding to the Stories of Survivors of Surgical Mesh. And it's a report which really presents the negative impacts that mesh has had in the lives of many New Zealanders and their whanau. And part of this report um, outlined a series of proposed actions in order to repair harm, restore well-being, and ensure patient safety in the future, including interdisciplinary education in order to prevent future harm and reduce severity of existing harm. And as part of that, um, we've been part of developing an education package for primary healthcare providers. And so this webinar is, is part of that process. Now, the, the report, um, I think this, this uh, um, quote really kind of sums it up. There have been many mesh injured women um, over time, and this woman who states mesh might have saved my life in the moment, but the long term impacts are devastating. I think this is um, a really important take home message that sometimes the physical effects are one thing, but the psychosocial effects are, are quite another. It's important to know that we are still using mesh, um, and so there will be people coming forward potentially with mesh harm in the future. It's not just a thing of the past. Um, we currently use um, the retropubic medurethral sling for stress urinary incontinence. It's sometimes referred to as a TVT. And for pelvic organ prolapse, we no longer place mesh through the vagina, but we do place it abdominally. This picture on the right um, shows how we place it attached to the sacral promontory internally um, and then to the front and back walls of the vagina from an abdominal approach. Um, at the moment, there is um, the Ministry of Health are undergoing a credentialing process to ensure that moving forward, surgeons who are placing mesh um, are appropriately trained um, and are able to provide long-term follow-up and manage complications appropriately. So kind of when we think about what, what used to happen, there are lots of different kinds of meshes that used to be placed um, and most of these are no longer available. Um, the one in the top left corner, the transobturator sling, this was a common treatment for stress urinary incontinence and it has a different um, approach. Um, the arms pass through the transobturator foramen. This is only used very rarely now in select indications. These other um, examples that we've shown here um, are where quite big sheets of mesh um, were, were placed um, through the vagina. And you can see particularly the picture on the right, there were kind of six arms that were coming through um, various places. So we had, you know, four arms coming through the transobturator foramens anteriorly, and then two coming posteriorly and coming out kind of near the buttocks. Um, so you can kind of see why um, problems might have occurred. Um, some, some, I'll leave this one for you. Thank you, Nikki. So this, um is really taken from the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. So the reason I've shown this slide is so that people actually know what constitutes a poor outcome with mesh implantation. It may not all relate to um, uh, GPs, uh, primary care, um, but, but some of them are actually important. Um, some of the post-op uh, problems that you may see in your practice would be things like patients having recurrent urinary tract infection, for instance, after um, their mesh sling was placed. Um, most of them are actually post-op complications that surgeons would be involved in, but there are other things like vaginal pain, patient complaining, on, complaining of um, dyspareunia and up to more than six weeks after surgery. And um, things like overactive bladder, which is very common. And some patients would have had pre-existing overactive bladder problems before the sling is being placed. But um, we're really talking about new onset of overactive bladder symptoms after the sling is being placed. So some of these may uh, be more of a specialist care um, problem. But I think um, I definitely have seen GPs actually picking up all these problems um, after patients have had their sling or their mesh being placed and after they've been discharged from specialist care. 
So I think it's worth talking um, about there are certainly different degrees of the impact of harm. You know, there have been many women who've had successful mesh surgeries with no harm, but there have been many women who have been harmed. Um, and there's a wide range of, of ways that these women may present. Um, occasionally, we may find an incidental finding of a mesh complication, which is actually asymptomatic um, and may not be causing any problems or need treatment. However, then there's quite a range. Um, there may be patients who have symptoms which may resolve with minor intervention. There are those who may have minor intervention and have ongoing problems that are needing management. And then we kind of move further down to women who may have multiple surgical procedures and have ongoing sequelae, so chronic pain, dyspraenia, or the inability to have intercourse, incontinence, voiding difficulties, recurrence of prolapse, and again, you know, the physical aspect is one thing, but also the psychosocial effect can really um, be quite significant. These women can have their lives really altered significantly. It may affect relationships with their partners, with their family, um, their ability to work or exercise. Um, so it's all of these things that we kind of need to be um, kind of bearing in mind when we're dealing with women who have experienced mesh harm. Um, when we look at the data that we have from ACC um, in terms of, you know, how 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 big is the scale of the problem? Um, in 2018, ACC published a 13-year review of surgical mesh-related injury claims. Um, and of note, the claims lodged by GPs have increased year on year between the last few years of that report. And actually, that's continued to be the case, which is fantastic news. So a lot of these claims are now being lodged by GPs in the primary sector. Um, there has been an increasing number of injury claims with time. Um, since 2018, it has hovered at around about 100 per year um, at the present time. Um, and also in October 2020, um, ACC initiated um, kind of an appeals process. So if people have previously had a claim declined, um, it, you can now request to have that reviewed. And there have been 115 requests for review um, over the last 20 months. And if it's then declined, it goes through um, a formal appeals committee process. So there's a lot more um, work going on in this space to make sure that people are able to access the care if they need, if they need further treatment. We know that um, AC, ACC data alone is likely to underreport the demand because not all cases are reported to ACC. And unfortunately, the true demand for services to correct or manage implantation injuries is currently unknown. So one thing that's really important when we're, when we're um, looking after these women is that we know that the way that we, we deal with these sensitive issues is really important. Um, it's really important that we do validate patients' concerns about mesh complications. Um, we create a safe place to discuss these concerns. Often these women may be very traumatized by their experiences or by their dealings with previous health professionals. Um, and it may be very difficult for women to discuss these issues. And ongoing support might be required. So this can really be an ongoing journey. Um, and you may see them at any point in that journey, but this may continue for many years or the rest of their life. So it's really important to kind of take that into consideration. So what are we kind of looking for when we're looking at symptoms of potential complications? So first of all, we, we kind of need to have a history of previous urinary incontinence or prolapse surgery. And we've put mesh and non-mesh there because often women may not know that mesh has actually been placed. Um, and we also find that sometimes operation notes aren't very clear. Um, there's a lot of different terminology that's been used over the years. So words like sling, tape, TOT, TVT, graft may all have been used um, and the word mesh may not be used. So sometimes people don't know that mesh has been placed and it can be quite hard to kind of um, interpret um, any information that you have. But certainly it's always worthwhile asking any woman who presents with any kind of pelvic symptoms, asking if they have had previous surgery um, and trying to find out some information about that. So common lower urinary tract symptoms that we might see um, can be urgency, frequency, urgency or incontinence, um, slow urinary flow or difficulties emptying the bladder or urinary retention, recurrent UTIs, hematuria. Pain can be a big problem. Um, so dyspareunia, or what we refer to as kind of his perunia, where a male partner may feel scratching on the penis with intercourse. Um, chronic or intermittent pain in the pelvis, lower back, hip or leg. So not just in the vagina, it can really affect um, the, the lower part of the body. Vaginal bleeding or discharge or recurrent vaginal infections. Bowel dysfunction or rectal bleeding and pain, particularly if there has been mesh used quite close to the bowel. Um, and certainly poor functional outcome. Um, so difficulty sitting, walking, loss of um, usual activity, sexual function, and long-term dependence on pain meds. And there's also some unusual neurological or pain symptoms that on first thought you, you might think have nothing to do with the vagina, but actually may. Um, and we've got some complicated presentations which some some will go through a bit later on to kind of highlight that this can be can um, present in quite unusual ways sometimes. 
Um, when we look at the anatomy, you know, why might we be getting some of these symptoms? The picture on the left here shows um, one of the big sheets of mesh in the vagina coming through the, the front, the top and the back of the vagina and with six arms. The back arms that we've kind of circled there is going um, through or near the sacrospinous ligament. If you look at the picture on the right, that sacrospinous ligament is very close to particularly the pedendal nerve. The pedendal nerve runs right behind that. And the big nerve um, next to it is the sciatic nerve. So we've got a lot of nerves around here. Um, and sometimes, you know, despite best intentions, the mesh is not sitting in the right place and can affect the nerves, these nerves. There's also a lot of other smaller nerves around there as well, like the inferior gluteal nerve. So you can get all sorts of pain um, relating to that. Um, and this is the transobturator sling, which, um, as I said, is used very infrequently in New Zealand now. Um, but this is where the parts of the arms of the mesh pass through the groin. And you can see this picture on the right that shows um, the device that's used to place the mesh in kind of the relative kind of safety zone. But the two nerves very close there, the one that's coming through the top um, is the obturator nerve. And the one that's covered in green, that's the pudendal nerve. So very close to those nerves. Um, and so it's, it can be... Uh, not really that far away anatomically um, when you're placing a sling, even when the sling is placed correctly. Um, and this is a paper that was published 15 years ago, but one of the first kind of um, reports of a significant complication from a transobturator tape. Um, and you can see here, particularly in that diagram on the bottom, that the tape has really wrapped right around the obturator nerve and the obturator bundle. And this woman had a massive um, hematoma. So certainly we can see quite significant complications like this when the when the path is not being quite where it should have been with the mesh placement. So in terms of signs that we would be kind of looking out for um, on examination, so with general examination, sometimes um, patients may have mobility issues with gait or poor balance, particularly if they've had neurological injury. Um, they may be unable to sit comfortably during the consultation. On abdominal examination, there may be tenderness in the lower abdomen, the buttocks, suprapubically or around the pubic bone. Um, we also would kind of sometimes examine to, to look at where the exit sites of mesh might have been. On vaginal examination, um, on the vulva and perineum, there may well be signs of atrophy, signs of excoriation from urine incontinence. Um, there may be urinary incontinence with Valsalva on exam. And on speculum examination, um, you may see unusual vaginal discharge, atrophy. You may see visible mesh, mesh exposure, um, such as this picture that we've shown there. Um, but in reality, sometimes mesh exposure can actually be quite hard to see. Um, and it's always worthwhile doing a digital vaginal examination if the patient can tolerate that. Um, because sometimes uh, even with, you know, see-through speculums where you can get quite a good view, um, you can't always see it in Sometimes you can really only feel um, the mesh exposure as something kind of sharp or kind of scratching in the vaginal through the vaginal mucosa. Um, and it's also worthwhile um, kind of assessing pelvic floor muscles in terms of tenderness there if, you can, if you're able to. Um, now, sometimes patients may have quite complicated neurological symptoms which require a neurological examination. Um, we know that you only have 15 minutes um, in primary care, and so sometimes considering a second appointment might be helpful to really give these women the time that they need to really kind of work through the issues that they're experiencing. Um, and we just wanted to highlight some kind of red flags for unexpected outcomes that may occur quite soon after surgery. So uh, within the first few weeks of surgery, if, if women were having difficulties passing urine, recurrent bladder or vaginal infections, severe post-operative pain that's not improving, persistent pelvic pain after six weeks or persistent bleeding or discharge after six weeks. These are all things that the surgeon um, really needs to know about. And particularly at the moment with COVID delays in the hospital setting, these routine post-operative appointments aren't necessarily happening at kind of the six week mark. So um, if, if, if you see someone and you're seeing them repeated times within the first few weeks of surgery, please refer them. Um, either to the original surgeon or to a or to a local service so that they can be seen um, because these are warning symptoms that something's not right. So um, through the course of this presentation, we do have three fictional cases, which we're going to go through. Um, and this is the first one. This is fictional, but it is based on the type of presentation that we, um, we may see. Um, and so this is a 52-year-old woman who presented with gradually worsening dyspraenia and pelvic pain over the last year having recently gone through the menopause. So this is not an uncommon presentation for someone who's gone through the menopause to be developing dyspraenia. But in this situation, this woman has had a previous midgerethral sling for stress incontinence five years earlier. Now that procedure was successful and she reported normal bladder function since that time. But this should already be kind of just, you know, starting to ring some warning bells. 
So on examination, there was marked atrophy of the vagina, no obvious mesh exposure, and she was very tender and tense generally um, within the vagina. So this one was commenced on estrogen cream and referred for review. Um, and when seen in the urogynecology clinic, um, again, there was no mesh exposure identified. The woman was very tender over the pelvic floor muscles, but also over the path of the sling. So in this situation, it may be that there was atrophy, which then led to causing pain with intercourse, um, which then led to kind of a reflex hypertonic, you know, tight pelvic floor muscles. But there is that possibility that it could be mesh causing pain. And so it's kind of hard to say from here where this could go, because this sort of case could kind of go any one of a number of ways. We would often then continue with the estrogen cream and, and get an experienced woman's health physiotherapist to work on relaxing the pelvic floor. But if that didn't work, then we'd be needing to think about whether um, the mesh needed to be removed, um, whether that was going to be something that we needed to talk to the woman about. And again, this could just be the start of this woman's journey, because removing the mesh um, may itself kind of lead to further ongoing problems that need to be managed, like recurrent incontinence or persistent pain. Um, so it's just worth bearing in mind that... Um, that many different outcomes can occur from any one of these kind of presentations. Um, so um, this, in terms of um, working out what to do when you see somebody with a mesh, possible mesh complication, um, this has been published recently on the Health Pathways um, site, and it's now published nationwide. So um, some of the pathways are more localized than others, but this is available. Um, there's a comment, that, so this basically talks about kind of investigations and kind of management, um, which we'll be kind of going through. Um, and there's a note here talking about um, the mesh complication services that are being set up, and we'll kind of come back to that. But this is where once that is set up, this will be the pathway um, in terms of making those referrals. So the initial investigations in primary care for a suspected mesh complication may include um, a midstream urine to exclude a UTI or look for hematuria, uh, vaginal swabs for vaginal discharge, and also considering some baseline blood tests to look for signs of infection or inflammation. And in terms of management, um, it's always um, worthwhile just initiating treatment of some of the associated symptoms whilst awaiting for kind of further referral and review. So treating UTIs, considering prophylactic antibiotics, um, treating vaginal atrophy with estrogen cream, and for overactive bladder, um, looking at doing a bladder diary and maybe a trial of anticholinergic medication if tolerated. Um, with mesh exposure, if they're able to use, uh, if, the, if the woman's able to use estrogen vaginal cream, this would be um, a good thing to initiate. It's it's likely to not fix the problem, um, but it certainly is unlikely to cause harm, and it may help with um, ongoing treatment. Um, again, really important to validate the woman's concerns about surgical mesh. This is an ongoing journey, um, and she may need kind of ongoing support um, throughout this process. And also, it's important to initiate the ACC treatment injury forms. Um, so this is something that just to really kind of get the ball rolling, because if a woman is accepted by ACC, this can really kind of speed up um, the treatment that she may be able to able to access. And as we mentioned before, if a claim has previously been declined, um, it is worth asking for a review, um, because ACC are very closely looking at all of these cases and are reconsidering these claims. Um, and in terms of referring for review, it might be a little bit different depending on where you are currently um, in terms of what the health pathways um, states, but it'll be your local gynecology, urology or urogynecology service. And until we have that dedicated mesh specialist service, there is going to be a little bit of variation in terms of where these patients are seen. In terms of pelvic health physiotherapy, this is mentioned in that pathway. Um, it's something that it's really important that the physiotherapist is experienced in this area. Um, it, and and know how to manage a mesh complication because if um, it if done incorrectly, this can actually exacerbate pain um, and it may actually cause further harm. So if you have a local physiotherapist who's who you know has managed mesh complications or is very experienced with regards to incontinence and prolapse, then it may be worthwhile sending them through to be seen. But if you're not sure, it may be worthwhile actually just referring through to your local tertiary center so that the referral can be graded appropriately and the appropriate um, physiotherapist. Um, review arranged and, and other things to consider would be kind of continent services and pain referrals. So um, case B again this is another fictional case but not dissimilar to what we might see in our practice. Um, a 61 year old who presents with dyspareunia and vaginal bleeding over the last two months and her husband's reported kind of getting scratched when they have intercourse. So this woman has a history of two previous prolapse surgeries, um, a vaginal hysterectomy and prolapse repair about 10 years ago and then an anterior vaginal mesh repair about seven years ago. So quite a few years ago. 
Um, but on examination, she has a small, less than one centimeter area of exposed mesh in the anterior vagina, um, unable to see with speculum, but able to be felt with a vaginal examination and quite tender to touch. Um, and she had quite atrophic vaginal tissues. So in this case, vaginal swabs were taken to exclude infection. The woman was commenced on estrogen cream and referred for review and an ACC claim initiated. And this would be the, the perfect um, kind of initial management plan for this patient. And when seen in urogynecology clinic three months later, the tissues were well estrogenized, but there's a persistent mesh exposure present. So I think this is kind of important for a couple of reasons discussing this case. Um, you know, it had been several years from her surgery, but certainly complications can occur for the first time many years after the mesh has been placed. And also just in this situation, not being able to see with a speculum doesn't mean there isn't a problem. Um, so certainly doing a vaginal examination digitally can be really helpful to kind of identify that mesh exposure. And again, this is really just the start of this woman's journey. Um, she's likely to need that mesh removed either partially or completely that may fix her problem, that may be the start of more problems. Um, so it's kind of hard to know um, where this could go from here. When it comes to ACC, um, the ACC 45 and 2152 can be filled by a GP or other specialist um, when there's a suspected physical injury related to mesh. So if there's um, pelvic surgical mesh exposure or erosion, if a nerve within the surgical field has been injured or suspected to be injured, if there's other physical damage that's not considered to be an ordinary consequence um, of the procedure, if there's urethral obstruction causing bladder injury, if there's infection or inflammation. And so ACC may consider um, supporting investigations to determine if there has been injury related to mesh. And for an accepted claim, ACC supports are unique to the individual, so assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. And it may include treatment, um, rehabilitation and financial support. Um, and this is our third kind of fictional case. Um, so a 65-year-old woman presenting with recurrent UTIs over the last five years, often precipitated by intercourse. Now, this can, is a common presentation in an elderly woman. Um, and I know that commonly this may be managed with maybe um, a renal bladder scan, doing some urine cytology, treating with estrogen, prophylactic antibiotics. But in this situation, this woman's had a history of uh, a synthetic sling or mesh sling for stress incontinence. And she reports having kind of slow flow since then, needing to strain to empty her bladder. And recently has developed some urinary urgency and urge incontinence. Now, in this case, this woman had seen her specialist for follow-up a year after the sling was placed um, when she started getting UTIs, but was reassured because the sling was working well for incontinence, she wasn't leaking. And on examination, um, there was really no significant findings to be seen. But um, because of this history, she's had a mesh placed, she's having recurrent UTIs, ACC paperwork was completed, and she was referred through to a different service for review. So I think, again, two things. This is probably not an unusual presentation of something you might see in primary care, a 65-year-old with recurrent UTIs. But with that history of a mesh, um, mesh sling in place, it's really important that this woman is referred through for assessment. And the other thing to highlight is that if, if the original opinion um, is maybe not um, providing the outcome that you want or feel that there is a need something's not right and this needs to be actually worked out then referring back to that initial person or sending through to a different service for a second opinion and kind of a fresh pair of eyes to work out kind of what needs to happen next that can be really helpful thanks um nikki uh so this slide's really talking about um, tertiary management of mesh complications so patients that you have seen and you've sent through to us for an assessment. Uh, these are the likelihood of what we may do for them. And this may just give you some information about how you can prepare them because I think your patients will be wanting to know what could be what what would be the um, what, what would be the things that we'll be offering and to just to set them to give them a peace of mind before they come and see us. So 90% of patients that we see with mesh complications generally will require some form of surgical treatment, but not all of them. So patients that, uh, there are definitely patients that we manage conservatively. Um, for instance, uh, an elderly lady that um, has an incidental finding of a mesh um, exposure, for instance, and they're no longer sexually active, um, not bothered by pain. These patients do not require any um, surgical treatment. Uh, they can be watched um, and they can be reassured. Now, uh, many of our patients who has complex issues with, um, with pain uh, will, generally we will be including our MDT support, 
they most of them will end up seeing a physio, um, like what Nikki have said. Some of them may see a physio um, earlier on um, if they could tolerate uh, the uh, examination and doing those exercises without too much pain. Some will be needing physio, say, after their mesh removal, um, or some patients uh, do not want any surgical treatment and would like to try physio first. So patients with complex pain um, problems uh, end up requiring um, pain, a pain specialist. And also those that have, uh, who could access psychology help, especially dealing with the trauma, um, we'll be trying to access that for them. Some patients only require their symptoms being managed as in the mesh itself um, may not have an obvious uh, problem as in the scans or our examination doesn't seem to point to a certain part of the mesh that requires treatment or patients are not willing to go through uh, major surgery. And we, we often offer um, symptoms relief. So if they have aura, overactive bladder, they could try anticholinergics. And now um, some patients are, uh, could have uh, the B3 agonist, Mirabigron, um, but they need to self-fund for that. And some patients with pro, uh, a recurring a recurrence of their prolapse, but they don't have pain and they are willing to try a pessary, for instance. And like what Nikki said about recurrent urinary tract infection, a lot of these patients, especially the elderly ones, who sometimes we know have got a slightly tighter sling, um, but they are not willing to go through surgery or they are too comorbid to go for surgical treatment. Um, we may try all the different um, strategies to prevent the recurrent UTI initially. And also for pain management, um, like I said, we've, we sent them to pain specialists if, we, if it's beyond what we can offer. In terms of mesh removals, if they do clinically require mesh removals, then we generally talk about partial versus complete. Um, it is quite complex to make decisions for them. Usually I require two consults with them for that, so that they have time to think about um, some of the risks involved in either approach. Uh, and then we also include in our discussion about reconstruction of the mesh removals. Now, not all patients after mesh, after mesh removal surgery will require reconstruction, but they need to be warned of the possibility of um, complicated, well, risks that they take when we, when, we do their, when we remove their mesh. For instance, if you have a, vaginal, uh, a sheet of vaginal mesh uh, supporting the prolapse, when we remove them, um, it is very, very likely that they would have a recurrence. So we need to prepare these patients for what may come, especially with stress incontinence. If the mesh is put in very tight, if you're only doing a division or an excision, the risk of recurrent incontinence is a lot less than for someone who get a complete removal of their sling, especially if the sling is placed very deep into the, the urethral tissue and you will be losing some, you will you'll be experiencing some tissue loss of their sphincter. So we do talk about concurrent um, reconstruction or sometimes patients are uh, offered a stage approach. I certainly see that um, some of my colleagues here all overseas, they also offer both approaches. With regards to our experience, local experience, we don't have enough data to support one over the other. So patients generally are uh, given the choice. Now, most of these patients after their mesh removal surgery, even after their reconstruction, some may still have ongoing um, bladder issue or pain problems that we, we have to manage um, in a long-term basis. So patients that have uh, overactive bladder, for instance, despite what we've done in, in removing the mesh, they may still have residual overactive bladder symptoms that requires ongoing treatment like Botox or even sacral neuromodulation or PTNS. Patient that gets recurrence of their stress incontinence, who, pref who prefers not to have a, a facial sling, for instance, or a birch corpus suspension, they may choose something more minimally invasive like bulkmate injection. And this is a bulking agent that is like a, uh, a gel substance that we inject into the urethra to bulk, it, uh, to bulk um, the urethral mucosal tissue to stop them from leaking. 95% um, of this substance is actually water. So the body does absorb most of the um, substance in, a, in about a couple of years. So they may need a top up down the track. Again, I've talked about pessary use for some people for their recurrence prolapse that requires um, pessary checks and changes. Patients that get um, bowel dysfunction um, from uh, the initial mesh injury, um, generally we will have to 
depending on the severity of their bowel dysfunction, um, if they can be managed with uh, medication or pelvic floor physio, uh, we don't usually send them for an assessment with their colorectal surgeons, but I must say the ones that have are severely affected, they often get an assessment with our colorectal colleagues. With regards to radical surgery, um, we try to minimize this, but, um, but we certainly have patients that have gone through a lot, you know, despite what we have done, whether it's a partial complete um, removal of the mesh, they may still have um, an organ damage like the urethra or the bladder that we could not salvage with any other way. Now, these are um, tragic cases, really. Um, most of them would have had uh, several counseling and also uh, second opinions or third opinions before we take this route of um, removing their urethra or removing their um, bladder. So I think um, we, we do manage these patients in, in, in a variety of ways um, from the very conservative measure to quite radical surgery. So sometimes it's hard to predict how which patient would go. So if you do get asked by the patients about what are the possibilities, I think it's, it's good to give them a general idea of what can happen. And also we need to reassure them because I do see patients when they come to us that they are quite full of fear because they, they've heard about the most difficult thing that another person has gone through and they are almost too afraid to seek for help because they think that they might lose their bladder or they may lose their vagina or they may lose their urethra. So I'm gonna go through uh, this um, real case. Um, it's a really complex case, so just bear with me, it's quite long. Um, I'm hoping that we could learn something from this case um, as we go along. So I've got a proper consent from this patient and I just wanna thank her for uh, allowing us to use this case for um, educational purposes today. Um, she's a 51 year old lady um, in 2017. And she went through a prolapse repair. So she had an anterior posterior repair as well as a bilateral sacrospinous fixation and also a transobturator mesh sling placed. Now, um, I just wanna highlight this. The patient actually specifically said to um, her specialist that she would not like to have any mesh implanted into her body. So without her consent and without her knowledge, um, the transobturator mesh sling was placed. Um, in the um, operative note, um, like what we have uh, mentioned before, sometimes um, clinicians use different ways to describe um, a mesh sling. So in her op note, it was pretty brief and, um, and it was really unclear for most people of, of uh, a mesh being used. So in the early um, immediate post-op uh, post period, um, this lady had terrible, extreme pain um, in all these areas, in her left buttock, vagina, perineum, um, deep perianal pain, which is unusual, uh, pain in the back of her left leg, right down to her toes, and also uh, lower back pain. The left foot was also numb. She had urinary retention, failed trial void, and had severe constipation. Now, three months um, post-op, uh, she was still under specialist care, but she has been referred to a second specialist. Um, at that point, she was unable to sit due to pain. Her walking was very slow. She, it was extremely painful. Um, her urinary urgency, which is a new problem, um, was extreme. So she needed to go to the toilet every hour. She also had, uh, this is also a new problem, insensate urinary loss, and she had no sensation that the bladder was full. And her constipation continued. This is three months, um, not immediately post-op, so it's continued since the operation. So this second specialist did a very thorough examination. So this was detected. She had tenderness in her perineum, her left buttock, vaginal walls, and uh, she could uh, feel out the right sacral spinous suture, um, and it was very scarred but the pain was worse on the left side and the obturator, obturator muscle was also very tender on the left. Now there was no mesh that was uh, exposed at that point. 
Now, um, so these are the things, interventions that she's had. So within the first three months, um, this lady had two pudendal nerve blocks by the first specialist. Um, three months after the second specialist has uh, uh, assessed her, um, has basically started on uh, for physio, trigger point massage, tense machine, and started her on diazepam. And she uh, followed her up two weeks after she started all that treatment and decided that it was not, it was not good enough in terms of pain management and decided that she would offer an EUA, uh, release the sacral spinal sutures, uh, Botox to the pelvic floor, and repeat the pudendal nerve blocks with steroids. Now, she involved a third specialist in this operation. And since then, uh, there was a little bit of a period where they overlap. Um, the two specialists worked together. Um, uh, but um, the third specialist mainly was look, doing four monthly pelvic floor Botox and bilateral pudendal nerve blocks um, for a period of time, about three years. Now, a, f uh, the a fourth specialist was involved in that three years. Um, because of the ongoing bowel and bladder issues. And um, this lady had a two sacral neuromodulators placed. So the first one was placed uh, about February, 2019. And that has given her some improvement in terms of the urinary frequency. And uh, um, no, actually it was placed for urinary urgency frequency and also for fecal incontinence. Um, but she had some improvement with uh, natural voiding and also some improvement with pain, but it only lasted about six months. Because there was some improvement, the decision was made to uh, place another sacral neuromodulation modulator on the other side. Now, after the second neuromodulator, um, there was very little improvement really. So we received a referral in September, 2020. Um, the first uh, phone consult we had uh, because patient was out of town, was in February um, 2021. And uh, after the first consult, we've uh, requested for a 3D ultrasound and also a urodynamics. And then we find them each other for the first time three months after that. Um, the 3D ultrasound really is very useful to look at, uh, to look for mesh. And surprisingly, the 3D ultrasound showed no mesh material in the urethra or in the vagina. And the urodynamics, uh, even with the, both, both her sacral neuromodulators turned on, there was very little activity, detrusive activity, and um, she couldn't really void um, during the voiding phase. Now, um, because she had two sacral neuromodulators, we involved Medtronic, which is the rep that looks after patient, uh, that you know, could um, uh, come and give us some advice if we could optimize those devices for this patient. Um, so we had a second face-to-face um, -face consult before we had a pre-op consult and surgery was in September the same year. So you can see that these patients do go through a lot um, from the referral up to getting her on the table. It actually took us uh, 12 months. So it was a long operation. Um, it was uh, eight hour long. So in short, what we really have done for her was we were trying to look for the mesh. So we had both vaginal approach and uh, groin approaches to look for the mesh material, but we couldn't find any. And then we went, um, because she had a recurrence of a uh, prolapse from, from the sacrospinous sutures being removed, the operation was also planned for a prolapse repair um, through the abdominal route. So these are the findings. Um, we uh, couldn't find any mesh material in the urethra, um, which is what was shown on the 3D ultrasound. Um, we also did groin dissections with the help of our orthopedic uh, colleague, and we couldn't find any uh, mesh in the groins. We uh, went in through the robot because we were going to do a cyclical pixie. Because we couldn't find any mesh material, we went through uh, the into, uh, did a retroperitoneal approach, went through the in front of the bladder and also in the obturator on the obturator um, internus muscles. And that's where we found some of this amputated mesh um, remnant. So on the uh, left side, um, 
there was a about a six centimeter mesh uh, material found sitting on the obturator internus muscle. And um, its trajectory was uh, really aberrant. So we trace it with the help of our osmotic surgeon into the groin. And we found that this mesh has actually gone um, completely missed the obturator foramen. It's gone under the ischium and lying very, very close to the left sciatic nerve. And on the right side of the urethra, retropubically, uh, we saw about a three or a four millimeter little fragment of mesh um, in that area, and there were no extension of that mesh into the groin. So postoperatively, it was uh, not easy for her at all. Um, long eight hour operation took a long time for her to recover. Uh, her bladder took some time to recover despite uh, turning on the uh, turning on both of her sacral modulators pretty quickly afterwards. She developed a urinary tract infection. Um, her umbilical port site uh, got infected, required a trip back to theater for a wound washout, and she went through a long process of getting that wound healed up. Not only that, uh, there, uh, there was a problem with pain. There was an escalation of her, uh, her pain. And what we really discovered during this perioperative period is also uh, her bowels. Um, we needed um, clean prep every five days, um, pre-op um, and also post-op to try and um, clear her bowels. And that was an ongoing issue um, until we decided that she was ready to see a colorectal surgeon and finally had a consult and had her operation this year in March, um, where she had a lap laparoscopic uh, um, loop ileostomy. So even with that operation, it was also a difficult, difficult, a long recovery for this patient. Um, problems with a slow bladder recovery, like her last operation, UTI, and she had to do intermittent self catheterization as well for a short time. So um, this case hasn't; it's, it's still ongoing. Um, with the remnant mesh that is left in, the, um, especially the left side lying very close to the sciatic nerve, we couldn't, we really need imaging, um, but with MRI, um, we will have problems, which we can't really have an MRI at the moment because the two sacral modulator leads that she has are not MRI compatible because they are old leads. So for us to get more imaging, we will need to remove the two devices with their leads to get an MRI scan. And, um, and obviously the, the sacral neumodulator will need to be replaced because we have tested um, her with, without sacral neumodulators, she really couldn't void. As, um, whereas her bowel, um, even with the loop ileostomy, uh, there are still ongoing issues with bowel uh, management. Um, at some stage within the next four to five years as um, advised by the colorectal surgeon, she will need a colectomy, but we are already seeing problems now. Um, so this may, um, may mean that she needs a colectomy sooner rather than later. So thank you for bearing with me. It is a very long case and it's still ongoing. I just wanna point out a few things that we could learn from this, um, especially from um, primary care. So, one thing that uh, we want to highlight is the, um, the poor document, surgical documentation. So like I say, the, the term that was used, which is very common to what we uh, surgeons use is suburethral tape. So um, when this was um, said to her GP, uh, it was not clear if this is actually a mesh really. Um, so there were difficulties finding out if she indeed had mesh, Put in place or not in the first place. So these are quite common issues, quite common terms that, that surgeons use that can be quite confusing. Now, the second thing that is it's worth noting is, is the severe and unexpected post-op complications um, that she has un, uh, gone through. So clearly, I mean, patients may have constipation post-op, which is a quite a common problem. But the fact that the bowels did not work at all uh, or patient went into complete, um, almost, you know, bladder failure, you know, not being able to void completely with no sensation. These are very unexpected. And um, within the, I, mean, I think uh, Nikki showed in one slide about 
picking up these problems early. Some of these patients are under specialist care, so it's quite difficult for GPs to actually step in unless patients have come to you for help after they've been discharged or um, they have, uh, they've missed their appointment or are, the follow-up appointment has been pushed out because of um, you know, how uh, hospitals are like. So if you pick up some of these problems, we actually want to know them early because you don't really want to let a patient go into having problems with chronic pain. So that's why the six week mark is actually quite important. So I think if you find it difficult to um, get the specialist um, who operated on the patient to be seen, um, then an early second opinion uh, could be helpful. Um, now, I certainly have seen GPs that have really fought for their patients um, when they have sought for a referral to another opinion and find that there wasn't any plan or there was no progress and patient, and, um, and they sent for a third opinion, you know, get another opinion somewhere else. And I've seen GPs here in Auckland who has tried even a, a different DHB to get uh, another opinion. These are not really the process that we, we, not people normally follow, but I've certainly seen some GPs saving their patient that way um, by trying different means to get someone seen. Now, this case has, is, is complex in the sense that uh, there's, there are pain issues, bowel, bladder, sexual, physical, functional issues in, 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 in this case. So a case like this require multidisciplinary team support. So even if you refer to uh, if you refer to us early, then we can actually start activating all these referrals um, so that patient can be seen. Now, um, I just want to stress that uh, this patient has an excellent GP who had, who was uh, who is still very supportive, who is still looking after her, and the patient just really wants to thank her GP if her GP is online today. Um, for being there for her so that she could actually talk to her and she really felt heard. So I think the GP, this GP has been just remarkable, trying to coordinate between the specialist cares because GP doesn't always get all the notes from specialists, especially if the second specialist refers to the third or the fourth specialist and the third and the fourth specialists are writing letters back to the second specialist, the GPs get missed out in, in, the, in the correspondence. Now, I'm going to show you just, um, this is a, just sort of snippets of um, cases that I've seen. Um, they have, uh, they'll just highlight a few things that are important in each case. So um, a 40 year old with transobdurator mesh sling, um, difficulty passing urine immediately after. Now this should ring a bell, from, this should be a red flag straight away for, for all of us now. If a patient has a sling, they can't pee. Basically I tell them, they, this thing is tight until proven otherwise. So that's really, really important. Um, and this patient had bilateral groin pain, right side more than the left, and also reduced sensation in the inner thigh. Um, patient also have motor dysfunction. So abduction of the lower limbs were difficult and then really poor adduction of the limbs. So great difficulty with driving. And she had difficulty trying to move her leg from the uh, accelerator to the brakes. When you see things like this, you'd be thinking, how could a sling cause this problem? Really, this is the obturator nerves that are actually uh, being damaged. When you have both limbs like this, you worry about both sides of the obturator nerves are being affected. Now, next case, um, 65 year old, again, trans obturator sling and had an anterior and posterior repair. This patient had almost 10, 15 years of chronic vaginal discharge. Uh, recurrent from recurrent mesh exposure, had so many vaginal swabs taken, multiple courses of antibiotics, but was, was advised by clinicians that nothing can be done for her. The patient also has urgency and urgent continence following the mesh being placed. So clearly there are a lot of problems with the mesh, but this patient also has um, problems with fibromyalgia, had fever, temperature of 38 of uncertain origin. She was told that she may have an autoimmune disorder, wasn't sure if this is related to the mesh. She also has multiple drug allergy intolerances. So you'd be thinking, are these all related? Currently, the evidence for mesh causing autoimmune disorders are, um, are lacking. So there are a lot of, lots of reports or case studies that are not conclusive. 
but I think there's a lack of evidence to show that they are related. I certainly have got um, two or three patients that have um, have experienced experience at least the, res, um, the fever get, uh, being resolved after the mesh being removed. Um, so I think we just have to watch the space. There may be more um, reports coming out. We're hoping that uh, one of our patients that has um, sought to see a rheumatologist might get a good opinion from um, the person so that we could um, see how they are related to, to mesh. So this is another patient, 60 year old, five years ago had a retropubic mesh sting or TVT. And patient said, oh, I've had left iliac fossa pain since then. Most of us will be thinking, oh, this must be constipation. Oh, this must be diverticulitis, you know. Um, however, after getting a, a scan, uh, the left side of the mesh arm um, was uh, in the left inguinal canal. And uh, I think this is the last patient, 55-year-old, left buttock pain after a transobturator mesh sling. Again, when the patient explained, um, was showing us the, how sore she was in the left buttock, you know, most of us be thinking, well, that's quite far from where a transobturator mesh could be. Um, but when we were removing that mesh, um, you could uh, the left uh, mesh arm really was coming out close to the, um, the gluteus muscles. So the, the mesh was really placed almost diagonally in this picture that I was showing. The right arm comes up the transultrate near the groin, while the left comes out near the buttock. So this is Eva in my experience. So Eva obviously has been doing this a lot longer than I have. She started seven years ago, and I've only started doing this in, with her in 2000, from 2019. So majority of these patients, uh, this data is, is, is a combination, of, it's of the seven years. The last four years have been um, busier than um, the first three years. So this is what we see in our patients. Um, they have 40% uh, of them is, has, uh, is not really sexually active after their mesh being placed. And 80% has reported that they have pain with sexual intercourse. Um, this is pre-op as in pre-mesh removal surgery. And most report 6.7 out of 10 um, pain. This is the mean. And in terms of quality of life, uh, 5.6 and 6 being terrible. And following mesh removal, um, this is what we see in our 300 patients. 60% um, of patients that has the transobturator mesh removed, um, oh, sorry, 60% has improved in their pain in the transobturator group. And for those patients that had a robotic um, mesh removal, uh, either from transvaginal or uh, intraabdominal sacral corpopexy mesh or mesh sling, especially retropubic, um, actually, surprisingly, they've done better, 70% improvement in their pain. So comparing um, our limited um, results, we are uh, comparable in terms of um, what the literature is showing. So, you know, we are achieving results that um, people in other parts of the world are achieving. So um, we just wanted to briefly talk a bit about the Specialist Mesh Complications Service. Um, this is in the process of being developed. Um, and this is what we're kind of hoping that um, GPs will be able to refer directly to once this is set up through Health Pathways. So the aim is to have two services in New Zealand. There will be one in the South Island in um, Christchurch and one within the Auckland region. Um, and it will be a mesh multidisciplinary service. So there'll be a whole team of clinicians working together um, to assess and manage and, you know, and help these patients um, with the process. So uh, urologists, gynecologists and urogynecologists, as well as pain specialists, psychologists, um, experienced women's health physiotherapists, um, radiologists who can help us with the 3D ultrasound scans, as well as MRIs and MRI interpretation of these complex mesh presentations clinical nurse specialists, um, and we'll also be utilizing other surgical colleagues, such as orthopedic surgeons and colorectal surgeons. Um, we know this is going to take time to develop the service um, due to capacity and resourcing, so it will take time to build this up to be the, the, um, the kind of overall outcome that we want um, in terms of um, how we hope to be able to manage patients more efficiently um, in taking um, a kind of an overall approach. So um, I, we're coming to the end of our talk now, really. And 
when some and I were writing this presentation, we really wanted to reiterate the main take home message really is that if a patient presents with any pelvic symptoms in the context of a previous prolapse or incontinence procedure, refer, refer them through um, to a tertiary service to be reviewed, even if they've been seen previously and always maintain the really low index of suspicion for um, mesh harm. Um, it's really important to validate patient concerns with MESH um, and provide the wraparound support as required, including pain management, um, and also initiating the ACC claim early, because if ACC um, funding is available for that patient, then that can really help to speed up their, their journey. Um, there's just a couple of references there um, with regards to the documents we discussed. And now um, we're free to take any questions. Thanks so much, Nikki and Simsom. I think what a um, great talk with some really practical, I uh, think, points around referral processes, but also what we might see in primary care and what might be presenting to us. And I think um, really that reiteration of the importance around the ACC claims, um, quite quite good to hear, because I think often we can be reluctant as to whether this is the right thing to do early on um, and wait for directive around that. So that's really nice um, to hear that that's something that you would encourage. Um, we have had a few questions come through, so if you're happy to answer those, we'll start going through some of them. Um, one of them is around how the mesh, uh, if it is a long time postoperatively, how, how does the mesh actually become exposed? So is it through um, sexual activity? Is it through vaginal atrophy? Is it through movement of the mesh? What, what's the sort of process of mesh becoming exposed? I think um, for the most part, certainly changes with aging, you do get thinning, particularly within the vagina with atrophic change. And so if a, if a sling or mesh had been placed and it was reasonably superficial to start with, there may have been no problems for a number of years. Um, and then going through menopause um, with atrophic change, the vaginal epithelium really thins. And then um, it can be very easy then for, for fibers to start poking through. And perhaps that may be provoked by sexual activity with constant rubbing of that area also. Yeah, so it's it's not usually so much that the mesh actually moves, although the mesh certainly can kind of shrink and contract um, and cause pain. Um, but it's more to, it's probably, we think, more to do with the changes of the vaginal epithelium around that area yeah Brilliant. yeah I think that makes makes sense and in terms of um the I guess the percentage commonality of, of serious complications of sling surgery what where is the sort of percentage sitting of that we get with mesh surgery and is there a likely timing for the complications to um present themselves it's quite tricky in New Zealand because we don't know the denominator so unfortunately since mesh is being placed, we haven't been keeping track of these cases. So we don't actually know how many mesh has been placed in New Zealand. So it's very hard for us to then say it's this percentage um, of our patients are having these problems. Um, you know, internationally, um, in general, when you look at kind of big systematic reviews, in terms of, say, for slings, mesh exposure rates would be usually kind of maybe 3% um, of patients having mesh exposure. But again, you don't know, a lot of those studies might only be for kind of 12 months, two years, you know, they're not necessarily 10 year follow up studies. So we don't mm -hmm. actually really know. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Samson? I see patients present early, you know, very, very early, or even, even in 20 years time. So things, you know, you see all these presentations in, in, in different different timelines, but it's, it's really difficult to, to know. And it sounds like maybe that the data isn't yet and that, as you say, the, the um, way that um, surgical notes are written up isn't very um, clear in terms of being able to collecting some of that data. So retrospectively, it's not even easy to look at. Yeah. But there are clearly, I think you, you mentioned right early on, Nikki, that there are successful mesh surgeries. So it is not all, it's not every person who has a mesh surgery that is necessarily going to have these type of complications. That's right. Yeah, it's certainly true. You know, we may have women who have a small mesh exposure. Um, they may not need the entire mesh to be removed. We can just remove that small area of mesh and close it over. And that may be the end of the story for them. You know, they may not have any more problems, but they might, you know, they might get another mesh exposure. They might end up needing more surgery. Um, so it's 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 quite hard to know from the start how what the journey is going to be for that woman, if it's going to be straightforward um, or if it's just going to be an ongoing process, they're going to need more, more surgeries. But certainly, yes, um, it can be very successful um, mesh removal. Um, and in terms of mesh still being used in a primary operation, um, there is 
a reason for it being still being used there is there are success stories from that point of view and there are people that carry on with no mesh injury um like complications and so i guess you know is that the reason why it's still being used is it's a process for these type of operations yes yeah, so they so the the um the mesh sling is is the most well studied incontinent surgery that we have um and it was introduced and not long after it was introduced it was it kind of realized that it got rid of a lot of the other problems that had previously been reported with incontinent surgery and that's why it became rapidly so popular it was easier to use it had really good outcomes um and so there have been a lot of studies on it and for the most part it is still considered a very successful operation a rich pubic midurethral sling for stress incontinence would have a success rate somewhere in the order of 80 to 90% of women would be um, completely dry or much better than they were previously. Um, uh, but the main thing really is the counselling. Um, and so that's quite, uh, you know, we're much better now. I'd hope most of us working in this space are much better now than we used to be in terms of the informed consent process, because that's really important, you know, letting women know that this isn't a cancer, actually you don't have to have treatment if you don't want. There are non-surgical options and we would usually... Um, we would recommend managing it with physio, maybe trialing an incontinence pessary first before considering surgical options. So really trying to maximize conservative therapies because um, you know, 70% of women will get a significant improvement in stress incontinence with physiotherapy alone. So they, they may not need surgery and that's great, you know. Um, and then talking about surgical options, really got, you know, we have four main options for surgery for stress incontinence. So really kind of going through the risks and benefits of all of those procedures and working out what's the right procedure for that patient and making sure that women have adequate time to make a decision. Um, we have a document from the Ministry of Health with regards to that we provide to women who are considering medical um, for stress incontinence, which provides a lot of information with regards to the risks of mesh um, and provides a series of good questions that patients can ask their surgeon um, to make sure that they are making the right choice for them. All right, thank you. Um, there is a question here around um, a particular patient who had mesh surgery 20 years ago. Um, she's now in her late 80s. She's had ongoing pelvic pain for years, has not had um, intercourse in about 20 years due to her pelvic pain. She's quite now quite frail. She's had some cognitive decline and she's unlikely to be a candidate for further surgery. Um, and the question is around, is there, I guess, a, um, a point to applying to ACC? Does ACC provide compensation as such to... Um, these type of patients where they've had an ongoing um, concern of, of injury, where maybe a, you know removal or further surgery is not an option. Is there a process for people like this? Yes, I think um, it is still worth um, uh, an assessment and also applying for ACC for her. Um, it's not just um, for surgery, really. Um, I'm not... A, I'm not um, I don't know all the possible things that they could get out of ACC in terms of compensation, especially the financial aspect. I've no, I've no idea, but I think um, she still may need some management that are non-surgical, um, and it, it depends what uh, she requires. For instance, uh, the pelvic pain side of things, you know, she may if um, she if she needs a pain um, specialist to assess her, or if there's any physio that could help her, or um, some pain medications that are not um, easy to access by the you know normal clinicians. I think it depends how much it's bothering her. I think it's still worthwhile because, um, like I say, I think a, some the ACC person probably knows what she could access to. But if she's she get a treatment injury um, accepted, there could be other aspects, you know, the OT side of things, you know, the um, so I think it, it's definitely worthwhile being reviewed. Without maximizing that quality of life um, mm. rather than necessarily, yeah, definitive mm. treatment. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and actually, there's been a couple of questions around um, whether there are particular, you, you talked a lot, Nikki, about having a really, you know, experienced um, public health physiotherapist um, in this area. Is there a list or is there a place that we could go to to see or know who is experienced if someone does have um, cover to be able to go and see someone privately? Or I guess you, you also mentioned through the DHVs would be another way to do that. Yeah, that's a bit tricky. I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure about a list that's available. We kind of all know within our region 
Lipkin, who's very experienced um, just through experience of working with these um, excellent physiotherapists. Um, so the, the training um, for pelvic health physio is all kind of postgraduate. So most physiotherapists who complete standard physiotherapy training don't actually have any exposure. So it's just really important that they see someone who has had further training um, and experience in this area. Um, and it is, I think it is really it's challenging because a lot of the excellent physios actually do work in private and so we don't have access to them in the public system um but we also have excellent physios working in the public system and I think you know if in doubt probably referring through to the public system because even if we see the patient um and they don't want to wait you know we've got long waiting lists in the public system also they don't want to wait the nine months or whatever it's going to be to see a physio we can say to them hey I know a couple of really good private physios if you have the means to go privately I can suggest these these physios um so that's probably I think if in doubt um I, I guess you could you know contact the local physios and find out if there is someone who has a lot of experience or has had extra training in that area but otherwise I prefer through to the tertiary system I think yeah Brilliant. And I think through Health Pathways, we can ask for advice quite easily. So that's something that maybe a, an advice request rather than um, a, a clinic request would be useful for. And actually, yeah. we've had a couple of people come in with, with some suggestions coming through. Um, one is Melissa Davidson. I'm not sure where that person is. Is a pelvic health physiotherapy specialist. Continents New Zealand has a list on their website. And I think it looks like Physiotherapy New Zealand website can also help. So uh, as well. <laughs> looking at all of those places um i think uh, let me have a wee look at the next one is there a standardized approach to pelvic health across the nation or are there differing opinions depending on access to care and i guess you know it's talking about our equity of care across new zealand and what is available across new zealand is there any comment that you'd like to make around that i think um say if you uh, obviously, I've seen patients um, from uh, all around New Zealand. Uh, certainly, patients can be referred on to um, North Shore, Waitemata DHB, if they have major complication, and we are accepting um, IDF, so patients from outside our DHB to be seen if they have a major, they have major complication. So the public, in a public system, currently, we do accept those referrals. Um, patients that have uh, got private insurance, they could um, refer up to us, and we do see a number of them. And obviously, if they, if you, if you, if you have got ACC approval already uh, from primary care, then um, they are free to choose anyone they want to see in private to get this assessed. Yeah. Uh, there's a comment around. Um appropriate training and credentialing for mesh um, procedures and uh, someone's mentioned that there that is very topical in the media around uh, whether we should be continuing to do things like that uh, like mesh um, surgery until we have greater understanding I think you've almost answered that Nikki by saying that that really anyone who works in the space now you, you have a real sense of um, knowledge and experience and understanding from what has gone past already is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Um, so I guess with the credentialing, that is that is a work in progress. So that's one of the um, one of the outcomes from the restorative justice um, process um, is that there was a identified a need for credentialing and having appropriately trained surgeons. And so this is a process which is actually just opened up um, by the Ministry of Health in the last um, few days, um, of looking you know um, for surgeons being able to apply for some of these. And it's going to be there'll be different credentialing for the different type of procedures um, that you're wanting to um, perform. Um, um, and needing to provide um, evidence of outcomes over the last few years, um, you know, making sure that you your outcomes are in an appropriate range, your complication rates, all those sorts of things, and being able to demonstrate um, an, a good understanding of the informed consent process as well as the surgical procedure and, you know, being able to identify complications early on. So this is kind of an ongoing process. It hasn't, start, it hasn't been finalised yet, um, but it is certainly a work in progress. And so moving forward, um, any surgeons wanting to work in this space will need to be able to demonstrate that they've been appropriately trained and have the appropriate skills. Um, okay, moving back to our patients, there is a question here about someone who is actually um, asymptomatic, but uh, on examination, there is a, a very small um, palpable and seen mesh exposure and within the vagina, otherwise normal um, appearance, and again, asymptomatic. 
Um, the person here has asked, other than using topical estrogen therapy and, and review or regular checkup by a, a GP, do they need any further referral or, or management at that point? Would you recommend something like that? I think if the patient's not sexually active um, and uh, no other symptoms, um, and you know, this may not require a surgical treatment. But if this mm -hmm. patient's young um, and sexually active, even though they are asymptomatic, it should be reviewed because you don't want um, that to break down more and the exposure getting you know bigger and bigger. Uh, you might as well um, get it looked at now. In terms of how long people need to be on estrogen therapy, I mean, me, I personally, I put them on once a day for six weeks and then I'll review them in six weeks and see how they improve. If after that six weeks, things are still the same, which is often what I see um, because those that have come to see me are probably, you know, the exposure is a lot bigger. Then, um, you know, I, I prepare them for, for, for surgery if they are thinking about that. And I guess you're right. It depends on the age and the, the other parts of that patient. Mm. Um, how do the sacral neuromodulators work? Can you explain that, that in a little bit more detail? Because you've talked about them, and I guess in my mind there's a, a concept of how they work. Do you mind just giving us a really simple explanation? Yeah. So basically you, you have a lead that goes through the S3 foramen, and that stimulates the S3 nerve that actually paces the bladder. It's like a pacemaker. That's how we explain to patients. So the S3 nerve paces the bladder, but it also paces the bowel. So, so the, the real indication for uh, sacral modulation is really um, overactive bladder. So urge incontinence, fecal incontinence, and thirdly, for patients who have always gone retention. So it helps with voiding. Uh, so those are the three. So that case that I've shown, really, the patient has all three problems. Um, and uh, generally, you only need it on one side because you're pacing the S3 nerve on one side generally gives the patient quite a good outcome. Um, and very rarely do you see it on, on both sides. So usually a two-stage um, uh, operation. Now we sometimes do a single stage. So the stage one is you put the, 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 the lead in and then you've got an external battery the patient carries for um, a couple of weeks. And you want to see that the patient has 50% improvement in their symptoms um, before you take the external battery out and put, put an in, internal battery, which is the most expensive part of the device. And that sits under the skin like a pacemaker. Um, and so yeah, two stages generally. And if they and we expect about 70, 75% improvement of their symptoms. Great. So you can check that response before going into the next step. Uh, that's, that's right. Cool. Thank you. Um, and I, I think the last bit is, is there's a comment here um, around um, women who need to get would like to have some support or um, uh, help around something like this so there is a mesh down under support group on Facebook uh, and it's described as a very supportive and inclusive group when women are going through all these issues so just a shout out for something like that um, and I think we've really come to the end of the webinar tonight and thank you for all your questions audience and also um, thank you Nikki and Samson for all your information I think there's a lot of great stuff there that we can start doing in primary care and I guess just you know prioritizing how we manage our patients there so very much appreciate your time tonight thank you thank, thank you very much thank you thank you